Professor Tambe is Gordon Mackay, Professor of Computer Science and Director of Center for Research in Computation and Society at Harvard University. He is also uh, a director of, for AI for Social Good at Google Research in India as a concurrent, concurrent position. He is a recipient of Ichkai John McCarthy Award, ACM CGI Autonomous Agent Research Award from AAMAS, AAAI Robert S. Angle Moore Memorial Lecture Award, Informs Wagner Prize, Risk Prize of the Military Operation Research Society, Columbus Fellowship Foundation Homeland Security Award, and over 25 best papers or honorable mentions at really leading conferences like AMAS, AAAI, HKI, and many other meritorious commendations from agencies such as the US Coast Guard and the Los Angeles Airport. Professor Tambe is a fellow of AAAI and ACM. So please, Professor Tambe, go ahead. So thank you uh, for inviting me. Really appreciate uh, that everybody's here. So I'm going to give you an overview of the work that we've been doing on AI for social impact for the past uh, 15 years. And so we focused on areas of public health, conservation and public safety and security, focusing on how to optimize our limited intervention resources. Let me jump right into the topic by talking about key lessons we've learned. First, Achieving social impact and AI innovation goes hand in hand. Doing work on social impact doesn't mean we sacrifice AI research. Concrete example is one that I'll cover today in public health. We've been working with youth experiencing homelessness in Los Angeles. Harnessing the social network of these youth, we are able to show that our influence maximization algorithms are far more effective in spreading HIV information and reducing HIV risk behaviors compared to traditional approaches. This work required us to innovate in the area of social network and bandit algorithms. With respect to conservation, we have large conservation areas to protect a limited range of resources. Concrete example is work we've done in Uganda and Cambodia, where harnessing past poaching data, we are able to predict where poachers set traps or snares for the past several years have been able to remove thousands of these snares. The technical innovation needed here was in green security games, which combine machine learning and game theory. With respect to public safety and security, we've contributed a new model called Stackelberg Security Games and contributed new algorithms that have been in use by security agencies in the United States, such as the Federal Air Marshals, the US Coast Guard, and others. All of this work is only possible because of the partnerships with nonprofits from around the world. So lesson number two is related to a question I get asked about how do we get into this area of AI for social impact? And this answer is partnerships. These nonprofits are engaged in amazingly impressive work around the world. And our work is trying to empower these nonprofits to use these AI tools and avoid being gatekeepers to AI technology for social impact. The third lesson is in AI for social impact, we're interested in the data to deployment pipeline. This work is not just about improving algorithms. We start by immersing ourselves in these domains, trying to understand the problems that a nonprofit faces, the kinds of data that are available. Following that, a predictive model makes predictions on which of the cases that the nonprofit has are high risk versus low risk. But given limited resources, we cannot intervene on all of the high risk cases. A prescriptive multi-agent reasoning algorithm then recommends which cases to actually intervene on. And finally, field testing and deployment is crucial because social impact itself is a key objective. If we are engaged in AI for social impact, and if we don't achieve social impact, then clearly we are not engaged in AI for social impact. So with this introduction, I'm gonna go th through the two topics I wanted to cover today. I'll highlight some of the projects we've been doing in the area of public health and briefly mention work in conservation. In each of these, I'll highlight a particular multi agent systems reasoning technique. So let's start with social networks. I'll cover papers 
by the way, from 2017 to now, and I'll highlight the role of the key PhD student and postdocs by putting up their pictures in the top right hand corner of the slides on which their work is shown. So with respect to social networks, the motivating domain here is work that we've done with youth experiencing homelessness in Los Angeles. The rates of HIV amongst this population are 10 times the rates of the normal house population. There's 6,000 youth who sleep on the streets of LA every night. So it is not possible for homeless shelters to communicate with each one of these youth. Instead, they recruit key peer leaders educate them about HIV prevention, expect these youth to talk to their friends and their friends to talk to their friends and information to spread in the social network in this fashion. These are real face-to-face -face interactions. This is not happening over Facebook, for example. Some of you may recognize this as the classical problem of influence maximization in social networks. Given a social network graph G, we are trying to choose K peer leader nodes so as to maximize the expected number of influence nodes, maximize the number of homeless youth who are educated about HIV prevention. So we are given the social network and here each number represents a uh, youth experiencing homelessness and edge represents the friendship between this node and, and an adjacent node. And now we are trying to select some peer leaders, A, F and R in this example are three nodes. And now we'll bring them in and here's a picture of an education section actually in progress with our social work colleague educating these particular youth. When a particular youth, let's say A, gets information about HIV prevention, we, in this case, model the propagation of information in the network via an independent cascade model. What this means is when A gets informed about HIV prevention, there's a fixed probability 0.4 with which their adjacent node B will get educated about HIV prevention. And when B will talk to C with the probability of 0.4, so that C will get informed about HIV prevention with the probability of 0.4. So information is cascading in this network, and this is the independent cascade model that we will use. So, what kind of challenges come up when we apply traditional influence maximization in our context? And this is where we think about what kind of research challenges come up in AI for social good. And one big lesson here is a lot of these challenges arise from the lack of data and uncertainty, which is a key feature of our types of domains. So for example, I talked about uncertainty the propagation probability being 0.4, but there's uncertainty about exactly what is the propagation probability. We talked about peer leaders coming to an education session, but some of them are no show. So somehow you have to come up with dynamic policies that handle the fact that some peer leaders may not show up. And finally, the social network that is supposed to be an input itself is unknown. All we can do is query a limited number of these youth to uncover a sample of this network and from there figure out what to do. So I'm going to sketch some ways we solve these problems before getting to the actual results. So as I mentioned, traditionally it is assumed in influence maximization that if you give information to a node C, a youth C about HIV prevention, there's a known probability 0.4 that youth D will get educated about HIV prevention. But immersion in this domain shows us that there's uncertainty. And so we can model this uncertainty as being sampled from a probability distribution. And we may further model the fact that there's uncertainty of the mean of this distribution. It lies within this interval of 0.3 to 0.7, for example. So now we are faced with this problem of influence maximization under uncertainty, robust influence maximization. And we solve this as a zero sum game against nature. So we are trying to choose peer leaders to spread information about HIV prevention and nature is trying to choose parameter settings to cause our algorithm to perform as worse as possible. So we are trying to come up with a set of choice of peer leaders that is robust to any choice of parameters that nature might have. 
And so in a sense, this, in fact, this is a max min game. We are trying to maximize payoff. Nature is trying to minimize payoff. But the payoff is the outcome of a particular choice of peer leaders to the ratio of what would be the optimal possible had we known nature's parameter settings in advance. So how there are details of mixed strategies and pure strategies that are in our paper, but I just wanted to give you a sense of how we solve this game. So along the rows here are all possible policies of the influence. So you can imagine a network of 400 youth and you are trying to choose 40 different peer leaders. So now there's 400 choose 40 different policies for the influencer. That's a massive number. On the on nature side, nature is trying to choose parameter settings from a continuous intervals. And so there's a vast number of strategies for nature and influencer. Representing this game in memory itself is difficult, let alone trying to solve it. So one approach is this double oracle approach to solve it. We initialize the game with a small number of strategies. So just say two or three strategies for the influencer and nature. And then an influencer's oracle will provide a best response to the solved game, increasing the number of policies. And then nature's oracle will add its best response, increasing the number of strategies. And so the game grows and we iterate in this fashion until convergence. And often convergence happens with a very small number of iterations. And despite that, we can show that we converge with approximation guarantee. So this is a way in which we arrive at a robust policies despite the uncertainty. The second problem I mentioned is no-shows among peer leaders. So we may select four peer leaders at a time. We may not be able to select, if we have to select 20 peer leaders, we may not be able to get them all in once because we have limited capacity in a homeless shelter. So maybe we get only four at a time. But one of them, these are youth under difficult circumstances. One of them may choose to have to run away and send in their friend. Another one may not have a bus fare to come. So therefore, when we invite the this four in the first time step, and then we want to invite the next four shown in green, we have to take into account who actually showed up in the first time step. And so this is a problem where our actions lead to uncertain outcomes and there's uncertainty over our observations. So this is a ideal problem to be solved using a partially observable Markov decision problem of Palm DP, which chooses actions, meaning which youth to invite, observes which nodes actually showed up, and then gives us a policy of which next set of nodes to invite. Solving these Palm DPs is notoriously difficult. Therefore, we exploit the structure in the communities, youth who play basketball together, youth who hang out on the beach together. And by using these sub-communities, we can partition the problem and solve it faster. The third problem I mentioned is sampling the social network. You could imagine we could tell our social work colleagues, go and sit in a homeless shelter for a week or two weeks, collect data from all of the youth who are there, um, do expensive surveys. But this is going to make it very difficult to apply these techniques in different cities in the, to scale up this problem. Instead, if we can do something scalable, like sample 15% of the youth that show up on a day, and that's it. And from that sample, figure out who are the peer leaders. That's what we want. So we want to query 15% of the nodes in the population and provide a set of peer leader nodes to spread influence in a way that performs similar to the optimal possible had we known the entire network in advance. So AAA I-18 paper does that. It provides a sampling algorithm. The key is who to sample. Basic idea here is that we're sampling nodes randomly and then estimate the size of the communities they belong to and then choosing seeds from the largest K communities. Here again, we are exploiting the fact that these networks have a particular structure. They're sub-communities and we're exploiting these sub-communities in order to get the kind of peer leaders that we want. And here we can provide some theoretical guarantees which are available in the paper if you're interested. But let me move on to the results here. I mentioned to you the three innovations. We sample the network, we have a robust policy generation, we have multi-step policy. 
So the entire system together, putting all these pieces together is called sampling healer. Sampling because it samples the social network and then it chooses a set of peer leaders to invite and based on observation of who actually showed up, chooses the next set of peer leaders. Now, we recruited in the first pilot test 60 youth in each of the three arms of our experiment. 60 under sampling healer when the network is sampled, 60 roughly under healer where identical to sampling healer except it has a full network. And degree centrality, which is the more traditional approach, bring in the most popular youth, the youth with the most edges, highest degree. And in each case, we selected 12 peer leaders according to the recommendation of the algorithm. And then we observed what would happen after a month. And we want to look at the non-peer leaders, the ones we did not bring in for education. And here's what we find. Now, one lesson I wanted to emphasize here is that embracing interdisciplinary work as with social workers was crucial to understand what was the problem to actually test things out in the field. And so in AI for social impact, this is a constant theme. All right, so we started this pilot test. After a month, here's what we find. Among the non-peer leaders, the more traditional degree centrality method reached only 25% of the population. Healer, our algorithm reached 75% of the non-peer leaders. Clearly, our AI algorithms, influence maximization algorithms, are far more effective in spreading HIV information compared to traditional approaches. And sampling healer, the one that sampled a small fraction of the network, seems to have performed even better than healer. That just could be the fact that this was a pilot test with a smaller sample of youth. But basic point is that it's performing similar to knowing the full network. And so in the full test that we ran next, we use sampling healer and degree centrality as two competitors. So this next test was with 750 youth. This is work done jointly with Professor Eric Rice in social work. As far as we know, first large scale application of influence maximization for public health done jointly with three nonprofits, My French Place, Los Angeles LGBT Center and Safe Place for Youth. And here we are recruiting 250 youth in each of the three arms and we're looking to actual changes in behavior. 250 in sampling healer, 250 in degree centrality, which is our competitor, and 250 with no intervention at all. And we look at changes in behavior after a month, changes in HIV risk behavior after a month. And here's what we find. Among, in terms of reduction in condomless anal sex, which is one of these HIV risk behaviors, there's more than 30% reduction with sampling healer, but none with degree centrality and control. At the end of three months, when we looked again, we find that with degree centrality, there is now an impact, there is a change, but it's still not as good as sampling healer. The fact that behavior change happened faster with sampling healer is important because this is an HIV risk behavior. Hello? And because this is a community where people come in. Can everybody else go on? Can everybody else go on mute, please? Thank you. And we also looked at other high risk behaviors, for example, reduction in condomless vaginal sex. And again, sampling healer performs significantly better than degree centrality and control. This reduction in HIV risk behaviors was impressive for our collaborators. And here's what some of them had to say. I hope the sound comes through. Beautiful way to kind of like marry this, this tech world with the social service world, like and how we can, we can kind of go deeper and impact young people and elevate them. If this group became a, a really big thing, it could really help out a lot of, of youth. Having done this early work 
in influence maximization, we are now looking at the next steps. One big challenge is fairness. In this example, we just took influence maximization of one step, so a simpler model of influence maximization, like graph covering then. And of course, this is robust graph covering because some of the nodes are going to not show up to cover the graph, meaning to spread influence as we discussed. So this is robust graph covering. If we use robust standard robust graph covering algorithms and graphs in our domain, trying to maximize the worst case coverage of all nodes, what we find is that there's disparity among the different racial groups in terms of their coverage. So some groups will get more coverage than others. And so we've tried looking at fairness in terms of maximum fairness in our NURIPS 2019 paper, trying to maximum, maximize the minimum utility of any community. Diversity constraints at Ichikai was a concept borrowed from cooperative game theory, but each of these concepts provides a point solution for trading off performance over fairness. In our AAAI paper finally provides a, an approach of inequity aversion parameter that allows a policymaker to figure out what is the right trade-off that they want to make, which is essentially an approach that involves humans in this fairness decision-making pro process, which we believe is the right approach towards addressing these problems of fairness. Another direction we are pursuing is one of reinforcement learning for influence maximization, which has shown promise, and we're very excited to try to test this in the field. Let me now switch tracks and talk about health program adherence. And remember, I talked about this data to deployment pipeline, where the first stage is making predictions, and then we come into this prescriptive algorithm, so we go to intervene on. So I'm going to first talk about a predictive model in this next task, which is health program adherence. This is work that we are doing at Google Research India on maternal and child care. Uh, the maternal care situation in India is difficult. The woman dies in childbirth every 15 minutes. Four out of 10 children are too thin or short. We are very fortunate to be working with a nonprofit called Arman. We've worked with 80 million women in India. And one of the programs is called Amitra. It's a weekly three minute call to a new or an expecting mom. For example, a call may say, you are in the sixth week of pregnancy. Uh, you should en enroll in this government program. And this is done in a local language in the voice of the local health worker. And there's 150 calls that go out to mothers. These are automated calls that go out once every week. And in randomized control trials, Arman has shown that those mothers who listen to these calls benefit significantly for their own health and health of their babies compared to those who don't, in, don't listen to these. And 2.2 million women have enrolled in this Mitra program. So one difficulty Arman has, unfortunately, is that significant fraction of these women enroll and then become low listeners or drop out over time. So our task is, can we predict which women, which beneficiaries are going to drop out before they drop out? So Arman can focus their intervention. Arman can do live calling. Arman can perhaps send health workers to those mother's home and try to persuade them to not drop out of the program. So here's how this could how this prediction would work. We have data on listening patterns up to these phone calls from these women. So for example, mother number one didn't pick up Arman's voice call, automated voice call on in week one but yes in week two three four and five mother number two yes picked up the call in week one and two not in week three yes in week four not in week five and it, this goes on for hundreds of we have hundreds of thousands of these patterns and now it turns out that mother number two and four actually eventually dropped out of the program our task is to be able to predict just by looking at these five weeks of data of listening patterns that predict for our mom that mother number two and four are at high risk of drop off. So our mom can intervene on them before they drop out. And in fact, we built such a predictive classifier and then we tested with 18,000 beneficiaries. So these are from November and December of 2019. And we checked how many, you know, what happened in the spring of 2020. And what we find is that our predictions are 
very accurate in terms of providing high precision and recall, more than 0.8 as shown here. So we are able to predict which beneficiaries are going to drop out with a high accuracy. But does this help? So to test that, we ran a control test where essentially we had call interventions in this population of from this 18,000, 8,000 beneficiaries. Some were in a control group which had received no intervention and some were in a call intervention group which received an intervention call to try to retain them in the program. And in fact, what we find is that the call intervention doubled the rate of retention in the program for these mothers. So identifying women at high risk and calling them allows us to retain more women. So this is good. Unfortunately, in a population of 300,000 women being enrolled at a time, if we mark 100,000 women as being high risk of drop off, it's good. That's what we are doing. And the software is already with Arman. However, it is overloading their system because now we are tagging a large number of beneficiaries as being high risk. So they can only call, let's say, 500 women a week. And so which 500 should they call when we say 100,000 women are at high risk of drop off? That's what going to, I'm going to talk about next in terms of this prescriptive algorithm that determines who are the top priority women to actually call. But before I go there, I also wanted to show you one other domain that has a similar characteristic, and that is preventing tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is another big challenge in India with half a million deaths and 3 million infected in India. Obviously with COVID, the situation uh, has changed, but this remains a deadly disease. So to treat TB, patients have to take TB medicine for six months. This has a lot of side effects. So patients stop taking this medicine, drop out, which is a problem because not only they themselves don't get cured, but this leads to drug resistant bacteria. So there's phone calls to try to track which patients are taking their medicine on a daily basis. Again, the challenge for us was, could we predict in advance from these phone call patterns, which TB patients are likely to drop off? And so with data from Mumbai, from Everwell, which is a nonprofit there, with 15,000 patients and 1.5 million phone calls, we are able to improve the prediction rate in terms of numbers of true positives and redu reducing the number of false positives compared to the rule-based approach that Everwell used. All right, so we've made predictions of who's at high risk of drop-off. But we need to figure out who to actually intervene on. So that's the prescriptive algorithm. So imagine we have a healthcare worker who has N patients. Let's, for this example, hundreds of patients. And she could only call three patients a day. In reality, she may be able to call 10 patients a day. In this example, I'm gonna just show you three, three patients a day. Which three out of 300? She could say, I'm gonna call these first three. From then she figures out that the two patients took their medicine last night, but the last one did not. She encourages them to take their medicine. And now she has to choose which three to call next and then which three to call the following day and so on and so on for 180 days, which is the length of the TB program. So we model this problem as a restless bandit where each arm, each patient is a palm DP with a binary latent state. They're either taking their medicine or they're not, but it's latent, we can't quite directly observe. We can only observe if we call them. And our goal is to arrive at a policy as to which patients to call every day. If you imagine you call them in a round robin fashion, first then, the next then, the next, and that's wasteful because some patients are always taking their medicine, you're calling them again and again unnecessarily. And some who are not, you're not calling them frequently enough, only when their turn comes in. So restless bandit gives us a better policy, a more intelligent policy. And in fact, in simulation, so this is not, uh, until now I've been showing you real world results. This is from a simulation. Uh, the blue is our algorithm, orange is the best baseline. We show that our model for restless bandage not only leads to faster run times, very little loss in solution quality. So one of the most exciting areas of future work 
uh, with restless bandits is a 20,000 subject trial that we have ongoing with Arman. So this is the first trial as far as we know for restless bandits being applied in a health context and on this large scale. And we hope the results will be available very soon. I'm going to quickly turn to COVID-19 um, agent-based modeling. So as an agent-based modeling group, when COVID-19 came in and in the United States, of course, in March of 2020, we started building this agent-based model for understanding COVID-19 dynamics. This was our base for starting work on COVID. And this is an article that we published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences to show the results of this model in terms of populate between population variations in COVID-19 dynamics in three different cities that it was raging in. Following that, our next work looked at tracking disease outbreaks. So if you are Harvard or you're any other university and you're testing a small population of students to try to see, is there a COVID outbreak? Is the RT going over one, the reproduction number, right? Is that going over one? From this noisy data, it's hard to make out. We, our algorithm, this GPRT, is able to do a better job at tracking compared to traditional epidemiological inference tools. But I wanted to share with you this work on COVID testing policy. This is done with Professor Michael Mina of Harvard Pub, uh, School of Public Health. With the range of tests that have entered the market, the PCR test, which is a gold standard, which detects you very low viral concentrations, but has a high cost and delayed uh, arrival of re uh, results. And versus antigen strip, which has a, which requires a higher viral concentration, it's less sensitive test, but it's a cheaper test and you get results back in 15 minutes. So if you're Harvard or any other university and you're trying to test student population, should you be using the PCR test or the antigen strip? In many schools, as you may know, the entire student population gets tested um, once every week, twice every week, which test should they be using? So we look at modeling this using our agent-based model. And on the y-axis here is the total number of infections. On the x-axis um, are the two tests, basically the less sensitive tests. Higher is worse, lower is better. What we find here is that if we could do these tests every three days, same frequency, and we get results back instantaneously, then the more sensitive test is better at controlling infections. Here we are testing an entire population, meaning all of the students at Harvard and anybody found to be positive, we ask them to isolate themselves. And so with this more sensitive test, definitely better. However, because the more sensitive test, there may be one day delay in getting results back. If we model that, then suddenly all of the advantage of the more sensitive test is lost. There's more infections because we, there's a delay in isolating positive individuals. If because of the cost, the more sensitive test can only be run every five days instead of every three days, again, the advantage of the more sensitive test is lost. So rapid turnaround time, get, getting these res results back fast rather than a day's delay and frequency, having these tests run every three days more frequently is more critical than having higher sensitivity for COVID-19 surveillance. This result was extensively covered in the New York Times and Washington Post and other articles. We were thrilled, honored to see Dr. Anthony Fauci even uh, discuss this paper that we wrote with uh, Michael. Michael is obviously the big leader in this whole space. He's been arguing for these rapid tests the entire year with lots of follow-up. And he's even now consulting with the Biden task force on COVID. And finally, this year, I mean, uh, recently, these uh, tests, were, these at-home rapid tests were approved. And this is because of Michael's advocacy with the CDC and others. And we are glad that we could play some role in providing computational modeling so that Michael could do his work. So I was going to also talk about conservation, but I'm running out of time here. So I just want to briefly mention that we've been working in national parks around the globe, trying to make predictions of where poachers set traps or snares to help rangers. And what we've been able to do here 
is uh, using past poaching data, make predictions in parks like Queen Elizabeth, Murchison Falls, and Shripak Wildlife Sanctuary, where we identified infrequently patrolled areas, where we made predictions that some are high risk, some are low risk in terms of finding snares, and where we predicted high risk, more snares, more traps were found for animals, where we predicted low risk, less traps were found. This has led to a five-fold increase in the number of traps that have been found due to our system called PAWS in Cambodia. In fact, just in 2021, just two months ago in March, they found 1,000 snares and removed them. So this has been widely appreciated by our friends in the conservation community. SMART, which is a platform that gathers together World Wildlife Fund, Wildlife Conservation Society, and many other organizations, has now adopted PAWS. So PAWS is now globally available with SMART, with hundreds of national parks around the globe. And in fact, we're very glad to see rangers around the world downloading PAWS, testing it. And so hopefully this will lead to protection of wildlife around the globe. So this is something we are very excited about. So I'm going to end this by highlighting key lessons again. First, achieving social impact and AI innovation goes hand in hand. Our goal is to empower these nonprofits to use AI tools, and this is a way in which we can get into achieving social impact with AI. It's important to look at the entire data to deployment pipeline. AI, to, AI for social impact is not just about improving algorithms. It's important to step out of the lab and into the field. To embrace interdisciplinary research, whether it's social work or with conservation, as I've shown. And finally, lack of data is the norm. It's a feature. It's, it should be part of our project strategy. So with that, I'll end. If you wanted to follow me on Twitter, and here's a list of my co-authors from the papers which were referenced today in the order in which they're referenced. I thank you very much for listening to me, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Professor Tambe, for really a uh, very motivating and at the same time, technically very exciting talk. Uh, in fact, uh, I was just uh, uh, thinking that even in India, I think a couple of days back, uh, they approved the home at home uh, antigen test kit. So I don't know if these two events are related or whatever, but yeah, I think this will really help a lot to isolate it, isolate people very, very quickly. So, it's, it's great to uh, find that context. Uh, so let's see, uh, any questions for Dr. Uh, for, for Professor Millen? So while we are waiting, I had a, I had a question. Uh, so you, you talked about sampling the network, right, in your first part of the talk. Uh, so I was just wondering, maybe I missed it, or do you, uh, how do you validate uh, when you reconstruct when you, when you construct the network or estimate the full network? Do you actually uh, get the full data to validate, or I'm just wondering what you do in that case? Right. So I guess in terms of um, so so there are many ways to uh, go about trying to understand what's going on here. Um, in terms of comparison head to head, uh, yes, we we. Uh, certainly did these comparisons, right, where we looked at in simulations for sure, we looked at, okay, we sampled this network, and then had we not sampled it, and then, you know, had the full network and chosen peer leaders that way, instead of just from the sample, would we have done better? So we have done the, all those tests in simulation. Now, in the real world, uh, because, uh, you know, t testing things simultaneously wouldn't work, we certainly have done tests where you sample the network and then you look at a full network in similar identical situations, then choose peer leaders and see who spreads more information. And what we find is, as I've shown you in those uh, pilot tests, that sampling results in reasonably similar results. And uh, certainly we have theoretical guarantee. So there's different ways in which we have tested how well sampling works with respect to influence maximization compared to knowledge of the full network. I should point out that our theoretical results also show that if you don't have the sub-community structure, 
if the graph is unstructured completely, then sample, there's no hope uh, for sampling. You can construct these adversarial examples where sampling just you know cannot lead to a good result. Right. And we can theoretically show that. So it really is heavily dependent on this fact that the community has smaller sub communities. And so you can kind of rely on that to get uh, people from different sub communities and therefore sampling works. Okay, thanks. And I had just one more. Uh, it's not a technical question, but I, I was just curious. We mentioned about this intervention for calling the pregnant uh, woman to, you know, where, yes. you, where there's a three minute call every, uh, every, every week, week, every week. So I was just wondering because it seems like it is a one way communication. They just listen to the call. So why not just provide all the information in one go? Does something change dynamically in these weekly calls or it is just the static information which goes out? So it's a, a weekly call there where because week by week, you know, because a, a pregnancy is progressing, different health information becomes relevant in different weeks. So they are giving, you know, information for second week of pregnancy, third month of pregnancy, sixth month. So they're just giving different information as is relevant uh, to the mother at that time. And then when the baby is growing again, health information as is relevant to the baby's age at that time. So whether the baby is uh, one month or two month or different information needs to be given for the health, you know, in well, some cases it may be for vaccination. In another case, it may be for enrolling in some government programs. So that's why they give different uh, uh, information. So it's not it's all these phone calls that get spread out over. And, and and I'm sure there's also some logic there in trying to keep the messages short. I've listened to those messages. They are like these entertaining. You know, there's a little bit of music. It's it's uh, there's some kind of a rhyme. It's a very uh, entertaining three minute message because I guess if you give a long message, people probably lose attention. Maybe it's uh, good for engagement. I see. OK, that's 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 fair. Great, great. If there are no I, further questions, I uh, will have a question, but I don't know if there's please. still time for that. Please, please go ahead. Um, I was curious about one thing, and I'm not sure if you look into this one. So in regard to the testing, there are two tests, right? And one is less sensitive. So I would expect it's less accurate, correct? Um, I don't know. It's less how sensitive. Uh, so, sorry, just to be clear, it's less sensitive, meaning it requires higher viral concentration. Um, it's, it's not, this is only talking about the viral concentration required, not the sort of false positive, false negative. Right. right. Okay. So that was a clarification that I wanted to 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 establish. Uh, but still, uh, that means um, it's possible that some people may go undetected initially. Correct. Correct. Okay. So and, go on. So, so my 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 thinking here is that um, um, there is a trend right in the community. Uh, I mean, people that are not educated in this area that they might not uh, they might not trust the testing. They may they might point out to oh look at the impact. These people are actually they are missing. So initially they said there is no problem, and then later on there is a problem. You see, um, and that that might actually diminish the trust that the public can have in the actual testing. And I'm not sure, so so then it becomes a different angle that you can look at the problem. Is it better to run it this way or in a different way? And I'm not sure if that is captured in, in, um, in, in your work. That's, a, no, that's a very interesting and important question. This public health communication strategy clearly is uh, something I did not cover in this talk. It's a whole research area, as you know, by itself. What we looked at was exactly the point you mentioned you know, there are, because the test is more sensitive, the PCR test, there are people right at the beginning who may have for, let's say, 24 hours an infection, low viral concentration, the viral concentration is growing, but it's not at the point where the antigen strip will catch it. And so during that period, the PCR test can quickly catch these people and the antigen strip will not. So you lose those, lose catching those people. However, the issue is that because there's a delay in getting results back, so this advantage of catching people early gets lost. 
and furthermore normally you you don't you know when you catch when you test the person they may be anywhere in this period right from the time that they've caught the virus and it's growing to the point where it's at the top to all the way it's coming back down and so you don't know where you caught them and the more sensitive test may give a positive result whether the concentration is growing or the concentration is dropping down so it may also call people positive even when they are actually on the downward trend with respect to the virus and so if you combine all of these factors together and that's exactly all we captured in our agent based model that the advantage of the more sensitive test is lost and so i mean michael is the expert world's expert here and his main point is that the more sensitive test is a medical tool it's not a public health tool and for public health you need the less sensitive um, basically the antigen strip because you're trying to reduce the pandemic basically in the population. But if you're trying to test an individual, then that's PCR, you know, then, then that makes sense. So I guess trying to differentiate between what is useful for medicine, medical diagnosis versus public health. It, it does, I, um, based on what I know about COVID, I'm sure this one works well by the fact that the most infectious people are actually at the beginning. Uh, when they actually have the viral load, but they also have strong um, uh, expiration, so they can actually uh, uh, they can spread a lot of these viruses. So it might work very well in this particular case of the COVID, but in other pandemics may not actually work as uh, as well. That's that's one of the the, the things that uh, you may take into account later. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, thank you for those uh, very interesting observations. Parijat, uh, make one quickly pose the question. Yeah, I was. Thanks, Professor Milan. I just have one question that uh, when we you work in in India or other countries, how difficult it is to go through the bureaucratic uh, hurdles because you are dealing dealing with people's health. You are getting private data. Aren't they skeptical about a company like Google collecting information about people's health and whether they are pregnant or not or family information and how they will use it later? So how, yeah, can you please comment on no, that? That's, a, that's a, a very, very important question. And uh, I think the, we are not, you know, it's the NGO which is collecting this data and the NGO has the data and we do not ever get any private information about oh. people's identity or anything like that. Uh, so it's all outside of our uh, system. And uh, at most what we get is like uh, identify you know, anonymized identifier for a person. And uh, we, so we have very little information per se about individuals. Um, so we get kind of, uh, like I showed you these phone calls of a, you know, some anonymized ID, something like that. And so from those phone call patterns, etc., we are trying to make inferences, but you're absolutely, yeah, I mean, that's certainly, uh, so with respect to Google uh, Research India, that's certainly uh, where that is. But in general, the observation with respect to working with different government bureaucracies and so forth, yes, these are important challenges. Um, I have generally stayed in uh, trying to work with non-governmental organizations. So when we went to Uganda, I worked with Wildlife Conservation Society. I met with government officials in Kampala City and all that but I only work with Wildlife Conservation Society. In Cambodia, we're working with World Wildlife Fund, but we're not directly dealing with government in Cambodia, uh, or we haven't gone to Phnom Penh and so forth. And so that's generally been the strategy. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the way that uh, we have kind of dealt with working with all of these uh, organizations. And we found that that maybe shields us a little bit from, uh, from having to deal with the government. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Professor Milan, for the wonderful talk. And it was really a pleasure to hold, uh, to have you here. And I'm sure other they, people will have their questions and they will reach out to you either on Twitter or, or other coordinates. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank, you. Thank you. Bye.